This video will guide you through designing a PCB layer using Altium Designer. We'll be continuing with the example project shown earlier. Up until now, we've designed the schematic. The next step is to translate that schematic into a physical layout of the printed circuit board. An example product of this PCB layout is shown here. As you can see, the PCB layout is simply a series of drawings that can be sent to the fabricator to enable the manufacturing of a printed circuit board. In this drawing, the red line indicates the copper tracks on the top layer of the board. The blue lines indicate the copper tracks on the bottom layer of the board. The green markings indicate what appears on the silk screen layer in text and drawings. The components of each of the footprints can also be visible. Uh, as you can see, there's the joystick component on the left, the Arduino shield in the middle, the four pin Bluetooth connection in the top left, and six buttons of different sizes on the middle and right hand side of the board. The shape outline of the board is also drawn in purple. So we need to construct all of these elements and we're going to show you how to do that, starting with the very first step, which is to create an empty PCB document in Altium Designer. To do this, we go to the projects workspace in Altium Designer. So this is our schematic from earlier. We may wish to save it by clicking save all. So right click your project and select add new to project and then go and find PCB. We've created an empty PCB document. The first thing you wish to do is probably save it. So in my case, I only have one PCB and I only have one schematic and I'm giving them all the exact same name as my project, wireless controller shield. So remember, if you have a multiple board project, you will need to have different names for each PCB document. I'll save those changes and now we can move on to the next step. So before actually placing components on the board, let's make our job a little bit easier by setting up the units we're going to use and the grid size to enable easy snapping of components to a specific grid. To change both of these settings, we need to go to Design Board Options. So while modifying the PCB document, go to the Design drop-down menu and select Board Options at the very bottom. So the first thing to change is the measurement units that we'll be measuring the board with. Um, and this includes both the location of all components and how we measure the outer path that defines the board shape. So you can use Imperial or Metric. Usually you will be restricted here by what the fabricator can use, but there are very few restrictions. If it's Imperial or Metric, they'll be able to handle it. I will just say that the board shape in the example project was performed using metric units and it, you may find it a little bit easier if we stay in metric. Then we want to set up the grid size. The grids button on the bottom left will allow us to set the grid size. We select that. Now double click this highlighted row and change the drop down menu for step X to one millimeter is a reasonable grid size. It automatically changes the step Y, press apply, okay, OK and OK. And again, before we start placing components, another vital step needs to be performed, and that is defining the outline of our board shape. Typically, you'll just have a simple rectangle or a square. You really don't have to get too creative. However, for our example project, we've emulated the shape of a Super Nintendo controller. And I'll show you the steps to be able to get this complex shape. But before we do that, let's have another look at that shape and uh, just see what it will look like. So I'm going to go to the resources folder and have a look at the PCB PDF that is available in the resources archive folder. So as you can see, it's quite a complex shape that's mimicking the Super Nintendo controller outline. We'll need to create two large circles, each of 30 millimeters in radius and connect them with horizontal lines at the top and the bottom. Work along with me as I do this because this process can get complicated due to the complex nature of Altium's board shape defining tool. Well, to ensure that we get a board shape that is of the exact dimensions that we require, we should take advantage of the coordinate system that Altium Designer has. If you have a look at the very bottom left corner of your screen, you'll see an X and a Y coordinate in the metric units that we specified earlier. It actually tells us the position of the mouse on the document. So we can take advantage of this when drawing the outline of the board shape using our mouse and determine exactly what dimensions we want to use when creating that outline. The best way to do this is to combine the coordinate system with our grid system by setting an origin for the coordinate system at the lower left corner of the grid. 
To do this, select Edit from the top drop-down menu, and then Origin, followed by Set. We're going to place a left click at the very bottom left corner of the visible grid. When we do this, it resets the coordinate system for our mouse location to this origin point. And every single mouse position will have a reading that corresponds to a position in our one by one millimeter grid. So this will allow us to be precise in how we define the board shape. So let's actually start defining that board shape. To do so, we must change the view to the board planning mode. So go to the view drop-down menu, view, and change it to the very first option, board planning mode. You'll notice that the board shape has now turned green. Green space in this view indicates all part of the PCB board that we've defined. We need to redefine this green area. To do that, select the design drop-down menu, followed by redefine board shape. Now we have accessed the redefined board shape tool. This tool is a little bit tricky to use and I'm gonna give you some tips before we get started. So a couple of things. If you press shift and spacebar while you're using that tool, it will cycle through the different corner types that you have available to you. We can then press the less than and greater than keys to decrease and increase the corner radius size. Also, you can press shift to increase and decrease with larger steps. Finally, you can press the spacebar to flip the direction of the arc that you're currently using. So with these three tips, you can hopefully define any shape. Follow with me as we define the Super Nintendo controller shape of our example project. So I go to Altium. We're going to enter the board planning tool again, select design, redefine board shape. Looking at our PCB document from earlier, we know we need two large circles. I know that they have a 30 millimeter radius. And so I'm going to place my very first position at the coordinates 30 and zero along the bottom of the screen. So 30 and zero is right there. I'll place my first click here. Let's cycle through the corner options that we have available to us. If I press shift and spacebar, now this is a straight line with no corner. I'll just zoom in so that you can see this a bit clearer. So this is a straight line with no corner. Shift spacebar. Uh, so now we have a, a hard edge with uh, two straight lines that meet at a corner. Let's try and change the corner again. So now we have a rounder edge. We have a long straight followed by a small arc. Press shift spacebar again. Now we have a pure right angled corner. And just to demonstrate that we can flip the direction of the corner, press spacebar alone. As you can see, the corner is now on the bottom, the corner is on the top, the corner is on the bottom, the corner is on the top, there we go. So let's change our corner type one more time. And now we have the arc radius that is required to produce the uh, circular sides of our board shape. So I need the circle to be on the other side, so I press spacebar. And now I need the radius to be 30 millimeters in length. Currently, the radius is 2.54 millimeters. So we need to significantly increase this radius. The way we do this is by pressing shift and the greater than key at the same time. And you can hold them down to make it go faster. So we're looking for a radius of 30 millimeters. And the closest we can get to that is 29.997. And that will do. And now we want to complete a 30 millimeter radius circle. So the next position will be placed at zero and 30 on our coordinate system right here. So that's the first part of our board design done. Let's continue. The next click will take place at 3060 in our coordinate system. So I'll scroll up to 3060. As you can see, the corner is on the or the arc corner is on the wrong side of my drawing. So I need to press spacebar to flip it around and complete the semicircle. Spacebar, and now I'll click at the coordinates 30, 60. So now all that's required is to draw a straight line from 30, 60 all the way across to 110, 60. So I'm not gonna continue with this arc radius. I'm going to instead change my corner type to a straight line. So I press shift and spacebar. And now I have the straight line tool. So I want a horizontal line that stays at 
height of 60 millimeters and goes all the way to 110. There we go. And now I need to do the other semicircle on the right hand side of the controller. So we need to get back to our arc radius corner type by pressing shift spacebar, shift spacebar, that's a right angled shift spacebar. Okay, so now we have the correct arc corner type. Press spacebar to get it back on the right side of the ledger. And we need to place our next position over at 140 by 30. And this is the position here. One more click. Now we complete the semicircle by placing a coordinate at 110 and zero. And now we have to actually flip our corner again by pressing spacebar and click at 110, zero. Great. Now I've found that the easiest way to complete this uh, Super Nintendo controller is to just complete a three quarter circle uh, and place a point at 80, 30. So to complete the circle, I need to flip the arc radius again and press a left click at 80, 30. Now I'll change back to a straight line tool by pressing shift and spacebar. The next point will be placed at the coordinates 60 and 30. And now the final leg of our journey is changing back to the arc radius that we had earlier. And placing a click at the very beginning where we opened up this path. Now you can press escape and the board shape should be redefined. Now I know what you're thinking, we're not quite there yet. The trick I found is that we can actually modify this inner horizontal in post using a edit tool. So now you should select the design dropdown menu at the top, design, edit, board shape. Zoom in on the inner horizontal line and you can actually hover over it until it highlights. Now click and drag and bring it down to maybe the five millimeter coordinate level. So I'm bringing it down to Y equals five millimeters on my grid. And there you have it. That's how you construct uh, quite a difficult board shape. So if you're struggling with that at all, I recommend just doing a simple rectangular controller. However, it's a useful skill to learn because oftentimes you need to construct complex board shapes for a specific application. So we've successfully defined the board shape. Now let's return to the PCB 2D layout mode by selecting view, uh, 2D layout mode, and now it's also useful to reset the view of our document window to the entire shape of the board by selecting view and fit board. All right, the next step in the PCB design process is to import some design rules. These design rules will govern how the PCB components will fit together, particularly the width of copper tracks, the width of polygons, the spacing between copper tracks, all of these different rules must satisfy a certain condition to meet manufacturing standards. At the end of our design, we can run a design rule check to identify if any violations occurred that would prevent manufacturing. Fortunately, you can save and import a set of design rules. That's what we've done for this project. We've saved a set of design rules that are specific to James Cook University's milling machine. And most, if not all commercial fabricators will meet or exceed the limitations of James Cook University's uh, milling machine. So if you make your design adhere to these rules, uh, they will be applicable to any commercial fabricator. So let's actually import these rules. And the way to import them is we go back to Altium. Uh, you wanna select the design dropdown menu, then rules, the third option. Now you can right click anywhere in this tree pane to the left. So anywhere in this tree pane, right click the window and select import rules. Now you want to hold down shift and select all of these rules shown in this window. These are the rules we wish to modify. Then select okay. Now you must browse to the James Cook University design rules that we provided in our resource folder. So the location for mine are in my downloads folder. I recently extracted everything in resources to here 
and the rules I want are jcu.rul. Select open. You'll be brought up with a confirmation dialog asking you if you want to clear all existing rules. And in this case, yes, that won't matter. So I'll do that and then select apply and okay. So we'll touch on this again, but we'll be able to run a design rule check once we're ready to fabricate the design to see if any of our rules were violated. Let's move on to actually positioning the components within our PCB. To position the components in the PCB, we first have to go back to our schematic document and select design update PCB document. Let's go ahead and do that in Altium. So I'll save all of my work up until now. Uh, now I wanna go back to the schematic document. I can do that by opening the schematic document tab. To update the PCB components, select design and the very first option, update PCB document. Altium brings up what is called an engineering change order window. It tells us that all of these components that exist in the schematic need to be added into our PCB. I agree with this and I will click execute changes. After some time, Altium will execute every addition of a component into our PCB and you'll see the PCB updated with the components in the document editor. Close this engineering change order window and let's have a look at our components inside of the PCB by zooming out. So here are our components. The first thing you'll notice is that they're existing inside of this red rectangle. So this red rectangle is what is called a room in Altium. Rooms are useful because you can create duplicate copies of PCB boards if you're working with a multi-board project. However, in our project, it's simply one PCB. And as a result, these rooms aren't exactly necessary. So you can just select anywhere in the red rectangle, press delete, and we can remove those rooms uh, from this design. Now, what you'll wanna do is position all of the components onto the PCB in an appropriate manner. We have our joystick component. Uh, next, we have our Arduino shield. Uh, we have our mini tactile switches, S5 and S6 for start and select. We have our four larger tactile switches for A, B, X, and Y. And finally, we have our four pin Bluetooth module connection. Also, I forgot to mention, we also have this James Cook University logo. You may be asking, how did that get in there? Because you don't remember adding that component. Well, it turns out the James Cook University logo that we placed in our schematic is actually a component from our library that I've created a PCB document for. So the logo actually will print to the silk screen layer of our printed circuit board, and you can position it where you want on your PCB for a nice display. So the way we position the components is just by dragging and dropping them into place. A couple of options are useful. You can press spacebar to rotate the components orientation. And you can also press tab to access some important properties. Three properties that you might wish to change are to modify the component designators and comment text. You can make the text larger or smaller or hide the text altogether. You can also set the location of all your components manually with X and Y coordinates rather than dragging and dropping if you want a more precise position. The final option is you may wish to flip a component so that it's placed on the bottom layer of the PCB rather than the top layer. Let's have a look at our example project PCB to see how we should position the components. So I'll go to my downloads folder where I've extracted the resources and look at the PCB PDF. So this is how we need to position our components. Uh, let's go ahead and put this joystick to the left, shield in the middle, Bluetooth at the top, uh, the logo somewhere in the middle, and the mini tactile switches in the middle and the other switches on the right. So let's just go ahead and do that uh, quickly with Altium. So the first thing I'll do is move the joystick to the leftmost position. Uh, and then I might want to place the Arduino shield in the middle of the board. Now I want to rotate it. So while I'm picking and dragging, I'll press spacebar a few times to get the correct orientation and place it a little bit in the middle there. Now I might want to position the James Cook University logo. Again, click, drag and press spacebar to rotate its position around. So there's a little bit of space where we can fit the logo in and it should fit just about there. Now let's add in the mini tactile switches. 
So we have the select button, the start button, and we also have our Y button, our X button, our B button, and finally our A button. The only component left is our four pin uh, Bluetooth module connection, and I'm not fussed. I'm just gonna place this right in the middle of our Arduino shield. So there we go. All of the components are positioned on the board uh, roughly where they should be. Before we start routing tracks, I would just like to improve the display of our text on the controller. We should be displaying which buttons, the A button, the B button, the select button, so on and so forth. Uh, so let's do that by adding in comments to each of our components. Click uh, S6. This will be our mini tactile switch. And what I want to do is change uh, our comment to tell it that it is the select button. So I change the text for the comment to select and we'll no longer hide this comment. We want to unhide it. And instead of showing S6, I'll show select. So I'll hide S6 and display select. Press OK. Let's do the same for S5. In this case, uh, this is the start button. So I change the comment to start. I'll hide the designator and unhide the comment. There we go. Let's do the same thing for our Bluetooth module. In this case, uh, the comment should probably say Bluetooth. Uh, and we can choose to hide the designator and unhide the Bluetooth comment. So we have S4. So this is actually the Y button. I'll change the Y comment to Y, hide the designator, unhide the comment. Do the same for X. Change the comment to X, hide the designator, unhide the comment, and so on and so forth. We'll also do this for the B button, hide, unhide, and finally the A button, hide and unhide. So we've kind of made our controller look a bit better. Uh, one other thing I've noticed is that our James Cook University logo has a small asterisk in its top left corner. That's because it is a designator that hasn't been entered yet. So let's hide its designator, which is an asterisk, so that we don't see that asterisk in the top left. And another thing to note is that the Arduino Uno Shield designator, U1, is actually overlapping our James Cook University logo. So let's hide its designator, U1, by selecting Hide. And there you have it. We've kind of cleaned up our design a little bit more with the silk screen layer. So I'll save my work. And the next step will be routing tracks. So as I said, the next step is to route all of the copper tracks onto the PCB to connect the circuits that we defined in our electric circuit schematic. So the PCB document editor actually tells us every single connection we need to make using what are called air wires. So if I scroll back to Altium, you'll see all of these gray wires indicating connections that need to be made. These are air wires. Once you route a track from its necessary connection, that air wire will disappear. The goal is to replace all of these air wires with routed copper tracks. There are a couple of rules when you're placing copper tracks onto the board. The first of which is you have to avoid intersecting tracks on the same side of the board. If you need to have overlapping tracks, make sure one is on the top and one is on the bottom side of the board. I'd also like to note that we encourage manual routing over auto routing. Finally, uh, our tip is don't route any of the ground signal connections. We're going to be using a ground polygon pore later in this video to make those ground connections. So the goal is, let's go back to Altium, replace all air wires except for ground connections with routed copper tracks. So to do this, we're going to use manual routing using the interactive routing tool. Select the place dropdown menu and find the interactive routing tool. So. Uh, let's complete some of the joystick routes. So let's have a closer look here. We want to route every single item that isn't a ground connection. The first and easiest one I see is the press signal connection. So you'll notice that when you hover your interactive routing tool over a pin that requires a route, it kind of gets a circular crosshair. When you see this circular crosshair, it means that you can connect a copper route to this pin. 
So we'll press the left click to create that copper route. And now Altium is automatically creating my copper track for me and estimating where it should go based on the air wire that exists based on our schematic. So I clearly need to press uh, the end point of my copper track at the crosshair of this other pin. And it will turn red. Now I'm, I'm still in my mode to continue creating a copper route. So to exit that, I'll have to press escape. So there we are, we have completed one uh, copper track and replaced one air wire. So let's continue and find the next one. So, so this signal is actually a ground connection and we're going to use something else to do that. So the next one I see is this five volt connection shown here. So the connect connection may be connecting this five volts uh, to the five volts shown above it here. All right, I can see one more copper track that needs to be placed from the horizontal pin on the Arduino shield all the way through and up to the horizontal pin on the joystick. Other non-ground connections that can be made on the joystick include the vertical sensing uh, unit. So to get the vertical sensor, we can click A0 from the Arduino Uno shield and create a copper track going to the vertical output on the joystick. So there's one more connection that needs to be made. And as you can see, there's an air wire going across our vertical copper track. So if we were to use uh, a top layer copper, you will find that Altium prevents us from intersecting two copper tracks on the top level. So what you need to do is create the connection from the five volt pin on the Arduino to this five volt pin on the joystick on the bottom layer. Then we can simply go under this top layer copper track. So to route on the bottom layer, you select the bottom layer from the list of layers at the bottom of the document screen, and then select place an interactive routing tool. To start the copper track, select one of the five volt pins and pass it through to the other five volt pin. There we go. All right. Every other connection on the joystick is a ground connection, and we're going to make those connections using a polygon pore at the next step. So let's continue by routing the Bluetooth and the start and select buttons. So by default, I'm going to initially place my first copper track on the top layer. I'll go place interactive routing. And the first connection I see is from the five volt pin on the Arduino to the five volt pin on the Bluetooth header. Press escape to stop routing tracks. We then have two more connections uh, from the start pin to D6. And from D7 to the select button pin. There are two more connections that need to be made in this instance, uh, and they're not including our ground connections. We have the RX on the Bluetooth, which must go to the uh, RX on the Arduino Uno and the TX to the TX. So as you can see, again, we'll be crossing the top layers that we just routed. So in order to fix this, we need to place these two connections on the bottom layer. Select the bottom layer, place interactive routing and start at either end. We need to go from RX up to RX and from TX to TX. There you have it. We've routed the middle connections. Now we can move on to the final connections, which are our large tactile switch buttons. Before we do that, I'll just kind of neaten up our buttons a little bit and make them evenly spaced. Now let's route our connections. Uh, so again, I'll start back on the top layer, select the interactive routing tool, and the first connection I can see that needs to be made is from B on the Arduino Uno to the B button. Then we can go from D5 to the Y button and we'll make a little path around uh, that ground pin. The next connection is from the X on the Arduino Uno all the way up to the X uh, button at the top of the board. 
One final copper route needs to be placed and that is from the A on the Arduino Uno to the A button. Uh, again, we'll be crossing top layer copper tracks. So before we place the copper, we'll switch to the bottom layer, select the interactive routing tool uh, and go from A up all the way to A button. And there you have it. So that's all the copper tracks routed. So before we continue, I'd just like to show you one more useful feature of the interactive routing tool. And that is the usage of vias. Vias allow us to continue a copper track on the top layer, pass it through to the bottom layer and continue it on the bottom layer. So this is very useful if we need to do some tricky routing around tracks that are on the same side of the board. So to demonstrate the use of vias, uh, let's basically replace the copper track that we just put down for the A button from D2 on the Arduino to the A button. So what I'm going to do is use the interactive routing tool via place, interactive routing, and we're going to start on the top layer, move over to about here. At that point, we're going to use a via to pass through the board and go to the other side of the plane. And then while we're on the bottom side, we're going to pass over B, the B track there, come back to the top with a via on the other side, and then finish the routing on the top side of the copper all the way to A. So let's do that. We'll zoom in and start at D2 on the Arduino. Uh, we'll go out to about here. We can immediately place a via by selecting asterisk on your numeric pad key. So pressing asterisk will toggle whether you want to place a via at this particular track position or not. So I'm just toggling and yes, so I'm gonna place a via right here and it will immediately switch from the top copper to the bottom copper. And now I can just continue routing uh, as if nothing had changed, but now I'm on the bottom side of the board. And additionally, uh, I'm only gonna be routing until I cross that B copper track, and then I'm gonna place another via on the other side and come back to the top layer so that I can finish my design on the top. So I click there, and now I can just finish my design if I zoom out a little bit, and there are no more obstructions on the top layer, I can go directly to my target path. And press escape once you've finished to close, and there you go. So. Vias are very powerful for doing more useful type of routing when you get into a sticky situation. And that's just an example of it there. It's actually not that difficult if you perform manual routing and it gives you more control over the final product. So it's a common feature of PCB design to strengthen the various connections to ground signals using polygon pores. They're simply two large sections of copper that will rest on the top and bottom of the board. Each ground pin will connect to these large copper sections instead of individually routing them to one another. This strengthens the ground signal and allows for simplified routing for our other signal tracks. Let's have a look at how to add a ground polygon pour in Altium Designer. To create the top copper polygon pour, select the polygon pour tool from the place drop down menu. Now set up the name of the polygon pour. In this case, it is going to be the top copper ground plane. So I'm calling it top ground plane. Make sure that the layer is set to the top layer and make sure that the net is connected to the ground. Press okay. And now we have to actually construct the polygon pour shape. Typically your polygon pores will surround the exact outline of the board. This means we'll have to create a polygon pour that is the exact shape of the outside of the board. We've done this process before and now we'll do it again. So it's simply create a point at 30, zero. Uh, try and get our circular corner arc by pressing shift space bar. Uh, and then you'll need to increase the radius up to 30 millimeters. I'm just going to finish this uh, creation of the polygon pore. If you have trouble, refer to the previous steps that we used to construct uh, the board outline. So I'm just going to go quickly through this uh, as fast as I can. 30, we go across to 110, uh, and then we go down to 0, 060, and down to 0, 060. And finally, we go and across to 
60 and finish it off as the original point. Once you've completed the outline of the polygon pour, press escape. So there's our polygon pour. Uh, you'll notice that it turns red because it's on the top copper plane. Uh, to finish it off, we'll need to drag this middle horizontal down to the bottom outline of the board. To do so, select the copper polygon and try and highlight that middle horizontal and drag it down uh, to that level. Like so. Now, one thing you'll notice with the polygon pours is that you constantly need to re-pour the polygon once you've changed its shape. So I've just modified the middle position of that polygon pour. So I need to actually go through and go tools, polygon pours, and re-pour all polygons. And as you can see now, uh, the entire ground polygon layer has been successfully poured to the top copper. And now you want to go through and do the exact same process for a bottom polygon pour. To do that, we'll go place polygon pour down the bottom. And this bottom polygon pour needs to have a different name. It'll be the bottom ground plane. We'll place it on the bottom layer and it will still be connected to ground. Uh, so we'll click OK. And now we'll again outline around the board shape uh, once more. So we'll make a quick work of this, zoom out, uh, 0, 30, 30, 60, 110, 60, 140, 30, uh, 110, 0, 80, and 30, 60 and 30, and finally back to 30, zero. Press escape and the polygon pour uh, pours itself. Similar process as before, select the polygon and drag the middle horizontal line uh, down uh, until it matches the board outline. Again, we'll need to re-pour the polygons because they have changed. We do that by selecting Tools, Polygon Pours, and Repour All. And there you have it. Uh, we've successfully added our polygon pours. As a result, the uh, air wires that were not routed for our ground connections are now connected through the board to our ground polygon pours on the top and bottom planes. So that's it for uh, our PCB design. The next stage, we'll be looking at fabricating our design, and that covers a few factors. We'll be checking for any errors that have violated our design rules, and then we'll be also looking at exporting our files into a format that the fabricators can actually manufacture. Thanks.